Now that we have our tolerable touch voltage, step voltage, and know what size of conductor we're going to use, we can now start looking at what grid design we want to install for our substation. Here's our typical 115 to 33 kV substation that we saw previously. As we know, we need to bury an underground mesh grid across the full area of the substation, inside the perimeter fence, as we are likely to get hazardous step and touch voltages anywhere inside the substation. If we have a metallic fence, we need to put the grounding grid 2 meters beyond the substation perimeter to make sure that anyone touching the fence is safe. So we can quickly define the overall dimensions. In this case, a width of 200 meters and a length of 280 meters. These dimensions are pretty much fixed, as we're not going to build a bigger substation just so we can install a bigger grounding grid. The next important question we need to ask is what will be the spacing of the grid conductors? As we know, this will have a direct effect on the touch and step potentials. In this case, let's assume a mesh spacing of 20 meters in both directions. As we've said, we can't change the overall dimensions of the substation ground grid, as this is limited by the size of the substation. But one option we do have is to change the spacing between the conductors, which will have a direct effect on the grid resistance, and therefore the step and touch potentials. And this is one of the options that we have when we are doing our grounding system calculation design. Once we've decided on the spacing of the conductors, we can then start doing our grounding grid calculations to see if our initial design is safe. To start this process, we need to look at the grid resistance, which is obviously the resistance of the overall grounding grid that we bury in the ground. To calculate this, we have this standard formula, which again contains many constants and grid parameters. Here's the parameters within the formula. Rg, which is the substation grid resistance in ohms that we're trying to find, we have rho, which is the saw resistivity in ohm meters. LT, which is the total length of buried conductor in meters. We have A, which is the total area occupied by the grid. And finally, we have H, which is the burial depth of the grid. Now that we have a base design for our grid, all of these parameters can be easily calculated. Let's do a worked example. Calculate the substation grid resistance for the following substation grid which is buried at a 1 meter depth in the soil, which has a resistivity of 100 ohm meters. Here's our standard formula for the grid resistance. Firstly, we need to develop some calculations. The first one is LT, which is the total length of buried conductor. Looking widthways, we have 15 conductors, all with a length of 200 meters. Looking lengthways, we have 11 conductors, all with a length of 280 meters which gives us a total buried conductor length of 6,080 meters, which is a lot of expensive copper conductor. Next, we have A, which is the area. This is simply the width times the length of the grid, equals 200 meters by 280 meters, is 56,000 square meters. The other parameters we know, H, which is the buried depth, is 1 meter, and Rho, which is the soil resistivity, as a value of 100 ohm meters. Putting all these parameters into the calculation, we get a value of 0 0.204 ohms. What does this mean? Well, if we look remotely at the substation and attach a resistance meter, we will get a measurement of 0 0.204 ohms. Obviously, the lower the resistance, the better, and we achieve a lower resistance either by increasing the total length of conductor or increasing the area. With our substation, we can't increase the area, as we've already gone 2 metres beyond the perimeter fence, which is the land that we own. So in most substation designs, all we can do to decrease the grid resistance is to reduce the spacing between the conductors, or to install ground rods attached to the substation grid, and therefore increase the total length of the buried grid conductor.